Everything that is built has a foundation, and the foundation must be strong and built correctly, or the superstructure just is not going to be all that it's intended to be. And the same is true when it comes to understanding the gospel, when it comes to understanding properly the teaching of the Bible. There are many, many people today throughout this land, even throughout the world, that have a Bible and they will say, it's the Word of God. That's how we learn about God. But their disposition toward it, and especially their approach to the study of it, may be very much off base. They may know, maybe, what Paul said to Timothy when he wrote, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Or as the American Standard 1901 says, give diligence, that's the idea of study, or be studious, disposition of mind, reflected in the action of one's life. And handling right, correctly, the word of truth, which says there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it, you must do it the right way to benefit from the information God wants you to have. And how much does the Bible teach in both the Old and New Testaments about the importance of knowing God's Word and our responsibility to study it? Well, there's one thing about it that a whole host of people don't know, and this morning we're going to talk about some fir a first principle when it comes to the proper approach to the Bible. A fundamental matter that must be understood about the nature, especially, of the New Testament of Jesus Christ. So we're talking about that which is essential, which is imperative, which is a must, if we're to be able to comply with the teaching of the Spirit through Paul to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15 and other verses that enjoin upon us the same importance of studying the Bible and rightly dividing the word of truth. And this particular point or principle about the New Testament, even the Old Testament, is one that has been challenged for a long time. And even among the Lord's people of the last 50 years, especially the last 30 and 40, has been challenged and opposed and very openly uh, objected to. And that is that the New Testament of Jesus Christ, the second part of your Bible, is not a pattern. And yet, I'm here to affirm this morning without fear of successful refutation that the New Testament is not only a pattern in its nature and communicating the will of Christ to us, but that it is the pattern to where one goes to learn the will of heaven today. That it is in harmony with what Jesus said about himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That no man cometh unto the Father but by me. John chapter 14 verse 6. So the way, the one way that is Christ is manifested, made known in the words of his last will and testament. That's the design of a will. It's the design of a testament. So that it can present one's will when that person's not any longer personally present. Christ doesn't walk this earth now. When he did, he forgave sins on whatever terms he chose to do so. But now that he's ruling at the right hand of God in heaven, the only way anybody knows a thing about his will is by the proper study of the Bible and the ascertaining of the authority of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in the very words of his last will and testament. So I'd like for us to consider that. Now by way of introduction further, let me emphasize that in Genesis chapter 6, Genesis chapter 6, God instructed, you'll remember Noah, to build the ark. The situation had uh, developed to where the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And God had determined to destroy man and beast and creeping things and fowls of the air. But the scripture says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And in view of the coming flood, we find that God then appeared to Noah and placed upon him a tremendous obligation. It was to build the ark to the saving of his house.
The ark was to be the very means of preservation of the righteous. God then specified, notice I say specified, he was specific. God specified the material out of which the ark was to be made. And you know he meant what he said, and he had no problem saying what he meant. Then he outlined, and we may say in detail, the very dimensions of that ark. God thus gave Noah, watch it, a very definite pattern for building that ark to the saving of his house. Then in verse 22 of Genesis chapter 6, the inspired record declares, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Now that's way back there in the patriarchal age, and that first great religion and period of time that God dealt with man through the heads of the families, the patriarchs. No written law, lasted for about 2,500 years, and in your Bible from Genesis 1-1 to the giving of the law to the children of Israel through Moses on Mount Sinai in Exodus chapters 19 and 20. Now turning to that second great period, the Mosaic Dispensation, a period lasting some 1,500 years, we see in Exodus 25 that God instructed Moses to building the tabernacle in reference to it. And he gave multitudinous details. He gave many specifications. He prescribed those things, said them plainly. Now there's a definite pattern that's given here. Moses then was warned, and look that thou make them after the pattern. Where'd you get that from? Which was showed thee in the mount. Exodus 25, verse 40. Now, it's interesting that if you look at the way the Holy Spirit in writing the New Testament that expresses the will of our Savior, the way, the truth of the life, that you'll get a better understanding of another important principle in rightly dividing and handling and right the word of truth that we must if we're to know God's will, and that is to watch how the Holy Spirit employed Old Testament matters to teach us better how to serve Christ under the words of the New Testament. So the Holy Spirit had the inspired writer to the Hebrews in chapter 8, verse 5, uh, write a warning. And notice, when he is about to make the tabernacle, that's Moses. For see, said he, that thou make all things according to the pattern that was showed thee in the mount. So he quotes from Exodus 25 and 40. And he says there's a lesson in that that will benefit you regarding the authority of Christ in the words of the New Testament. We learn then how to benefit from the Old Testament, which we're not under as law today as God's authority, as to how to be saved, to become a Christian, to live in the church, to worship God. But there were principles laid down during that time that have application to us as we look into the words of Christ in the New Testament. And he simply says, as he did that in his loyalty to God and obedience to the truth, as far as building the tabernacle, speaking of Moses, so it is that that should be your attitude toward the will of Jesus Christ, as presented in the New Testament. In Exodus chapter 40, in verse 16, we read, sounds like Noah again, Thus did Moses, according to all that the Lord commanded him, so did he. And it's interesting that here in the first great age in which God dealt with man under the first great religion through which man approached God, the patriarchal age, no written law at that time, you see then that God spoke to man, man heard the words, man understood the words, man knew in those words there was an obligation God was laying upon him, man knew that his faith came by the word of God and for him to exercise that faith he had to do what God told him in the way God told him and for the reason God told him to do it. You see that there. You then see it in the law of Moses as far as Moses is concerned. Same thing said about him. Does that not begin to lay down a point regarding how faith is formed and what a faith saves and how that I have a living active faith? It's when it's an obedient faith. And though we're under different authority, under the authority of Christ and the words of the gospel system, the New Testament, faith still comes the same way. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And of both of these men, the great writer of Hebrews, 
writing part of the New Testament of Christ, use them in reference to what it was to have the kind of faith that will save you in Hebrews chapter 11. So just as God gave Noah the pattern for the building of the ark, and just as he gave Moses the pattern for building the tabernacle, the writer of Hebrews makes it clear that just so God has given mankind the pattern for building a godly life. God has given the pattern for Christian character. That has to do with one's mindset, attitude, conduct. And the pattern for the church Jesus purchased with his blood, Acts 20 and 28. The church that he built, uh, Matthew 16 and 18, that you read of that happening in Acts chapter 2. He gave the pattern for that in words, organization, name, doctrine, worship. The very plan whereby man is saved, the plan of salvation, and the mission of the church of our Lord. And just as Noah was obligated to build according to the pattern, and just as Moses was obligated to build according to the pattern God gave them, then, just so we're obligated, and may we say very privileged and blessed, to build according to the divine pattern set out in the New Testament concerning the salvation of man. Now, I say this, and yet I dare say that most of the people that say, here is God's Word, here is the Holy Bible, don't have a clue as to what I just said concerning these points from the Bible as to what one does in this particular important principle of Bible interpretation in understanding the Scriptures that they study. They don't understand, and many of them openly oppose the New Testament as an inspired, divine, infallible pattern, or we may say also blueprint. I think there's a rule of action that when you study your Bible and see how the devil has dealt with God's people on earth, that anything really fundamental and basic and foundational, you can be sure the devil is going to attack it. And he's been wide open in attacking the idea that the New Testament of Jesus Christ is the infallible, inerrant, all-sufficient, and final revelation of God to man. Complete a pattern in all of what a pattern is. Now God who made us, who best knows us, he put us together, knows how we function, has always, always retained to himself the right to govern man. And the divine rule book by which he seeks to govern man at this time, and has been for about 2,000 years, is the New Testament of our Lord, of our Savior, of Jesus Christ. People over the years who tend to oppose the New Testament as an infallible pattern also don't like the idea at all of referring to the New Testament as a rule book. They don't like it. Yet you find in James 1.25, the Holy Spirit himself. Now that's God, folks. Does that make anybody any different? Inspired James in writing part of the will of Jesus Christ to talk about the New Testament as the perfect, flawless in other words, complete for what God gave it to accomplish, the perfect law of liberty. Now you tell me a law that doesn't have rules, and the very nature of law is a rule standard. It doesn't make any sense. It's just the devil talking and people wanting to believe it rather than be governed by those rules. Now, there's the problem. People don't like to be told you have to do it this way. Nobody likes to. You may say you do, but you've had to train yourself to do it. And you've had to train yourself to know God's will over and against man's will because most of the time you don't want to be subject to man's will. Not very much at all. That's the reason there's law enforcement on this planet. It's because too many people, they think they can get by with it. They're going to do as they please and violate those rules. Well, that's why people don't like God. That's why the atheist said God doesn't exist. If he can get rid of God, what does it do to God's rule book? The atheist knows if he admits God exists, he's subject to God. Well, a pattern is something which is worthy of imitation and which is intended to be imitated. It is a design. It is a guide. It is a model. 
It is a blueprint. And how in the world would anything in this world get done without those things? How? Just ask yourself, how would you get through the day without a design, a guide, a model, a blueprint of some form or fashion? We even talk about be sure and set a good example according to what? <laughs> you have to build some sort of objective law when somebody says according to what? When God gave to Noah the pattern for the ark, he was not making suggestions. He was not making recommendations you could take or leave. Moses understood clearly that when God gave the pattern for the tabernacle, that God was not making suggestions, expressing his opinion or recommendations. There are certain brethren among us who for years, and I'm going to start back many years ago now, who have very definitely over the years, and they've sown their seeds and done their work well because there's many more people believing this than there were at the time that the, what I'm going to read to you was written. But they very definitely and vehemently reject the idea that the New Testament is our pattern and blame all the problems in the church, basically, that on the fact that we teach the New Testament as a pattern. Well, here's one fellow that wrote way back about 1972, if I remember right. I'll look here in just a moment and see. The problem with a restoration theology is that it rests on the premise that the mission of the church is to set up a, quote, true church, unquote, in which all the details of church life are exactly like they were in a first century world. It functions on the assumption that there is a blueprint or pattern in the New Testament that the church is to reduplicate in each succeeding generation. Such a theology makes the church's mission egocentric and past-oriented rather than outward-looking and future-oriented. Now that came, and some of you won't know about this, some of us old enough to remember when Bob Nuff and the Work of the Kingdom then, to remember when it came out as one of the uh, very new efforts to get this idea across in the Lord's Church. And that was from Victor Hunter, some thoughts on theology and mission, from Mission Magazine, 72 it was in March, number 9, uh, volume 5. Well, I was around and preaching when all that stuff came out. And you know, at that time, there wasn't a lot of members of the Lord's Church who really accepted that. Although it was there, and it was growing. It, it was not peculiar to the churches of Christ at that time. It came much earlier. That is, it had its origin much earlier. Truth of the matter is, it had its origin in the mind of Satan. So it's been around a while. It should be observed at this point in our study that the attitude that's evidenced, notice the state of mind that's evidenced in this quotation. In fact, it was the underlying attitude of all of Mission Magazine and all those particular papers that have come out since then that stand where they stood, that this attitude is exactly that which is characteristic of the independent Christian church and the more liberal bunch of them, if you can be, the disciples of Christ. That's why they came into existence over a hundred years ago when they brought division to the Lord's church because they would not accept the pattern nature of the New Testament and said, well, if it's not expressly forbidden, we can do it. Well, it's not expressly forbidden. Thou shalt not kiss the Pope's toe. Well, I'm not about to start because it's not expressly forbidden because by implication, every other teaching, you can't do that as an act of worship without sinning or anything else like it. And yet that's a rule that people use to study the Bible. You get anything into anything. If you say, well, unless they in just so many words forbid it, we can do it. Well, you realize what all could be done? And you give my brethren, with the restraints the Bible puts upon us, if you give my brethren that kind of leeway, they'd have a burlesque show up here this morning. And sometimes they're not far from it anyway. In uh, his criticism, and you may not know about this book, but here we're going back 40, 50 years ago, J.D. Thomas's book, We Be Brethren, Dr. A.T. DeGroote, who was one in those days, remember I'm giving you history now, 50 more years ago, he says this, and he was right involved and a big worker in the Christian church. Throughout the book, the assumption is made that the New Testament is the vehicle or container of a pattern of church specification. Now, DeGroote goes ahead to say, 
from the foregoing survey of the experience of disciples of Christ and the churches of Christ, we may conclude that the, now listen to this, this is his conclusion, this is his view, his criticism of the New Testament being a divine pattern. He says, we may conclude that the more specifically the restoration plea has been defined in terms of governmental, organizational, and ritualistic patterns of behavior, the less success it has had as an effective and cohesive force in the Christian world. Now, that's just a bunch of hooey. If that were true, the ark shouldn't have floated. If that were true, then what was said of Noah, thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. And the same said of uh, Moses and his attitude toward God's instruction to build the tabernacle and his response to it. That's a bunch of hooey. Yet Paul said these things were written aforetime for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures, now that's the Old Testament scriptures, might have hope. You know, I'm better prepared to understand the pattern of nature of the New Testament, nature of the New Testament if I'll believe and understand what's being said in the Old Testament. And lo and behold, Paul says, for the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. Galatians 3, 24. Well, it's obvious some of them haven't studied the schoolmaster much, and I think I'll just take Paul, Moses, and Noah over Dr. DeGroote. They just seem to have a little more going for them when it comes to service to God than Dr. DeGroote. The pattern nature of the New Testament is inherent in the very fact that that, as I said earlier, it is the Lord's New Testament and what a last will and testament is. In Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28, our Lord said, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Then the inspired writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews 9.15, said, And for this cause he, Christ, is the mediator of a new Testament. Then the inspired apostle Paul declares, Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a covenant or a testament, yet when it hath been confirmed, no man maketh it void or addeth thereto. Galatians 3, 15. Dr. DeGroot and others of his stripe notwithstanding, for they surely attempt to. A testament is something which is to be taken seriously. I wish people would take it as seriously, that is, the Lord's New Testament of the Bible, as they do in writing their own testament to make sure whatever their worldly goods are is taken care of like they want it after they're no longer here to express themselves. It is not to be disregarded. Its conditions are to be met. The Lord's testament, the expression and the words of it of his own will relates to marvelous blessings and great benefits which are granted to certain ones when those certain ones, as long as those certain ones, meet certain conditions. Now what I've just said here is basically what you have to do when you're dead and gone, if you have a will and people study it and get out of it what you put into it that would be carried out, your will, you see, when you're no longer here to express it. Further, the fact that the New Testament is designated to be our pattern is emphatically declared in a host of passages. Whosoever... Transgresseth, or as American saying said, goeth onward and abides not in the doctrine or teaching of Christ, hath not God. He that abides in the doctrine, that is the teaching, the same hath both the Father and the Son. Second John verse 9. I tell you now, that passage, the difficulty with it is not in understanding. The difficulty with it, we do understand it, and we don't like what it says. And you know, most people don't like what it says. They tend to try to work around it, do something with it. Now these things, brethren, Paul says, I have in a figure transferred to myself an Apollos for your sakes, that in us ye might learn not to go beyond the things which are written. 1 Corinthians 4, 6, American Standard Version. Now, 
It's interesting to note that when Paul says, some say you're of Apollos and some say of Cephas, not of Christ, I learn here from this verse that he's saying that's not necessarily what you're doing, but you might as well be done it, doing it because I've transferred that to us so you learn not to go beyond the things that are written. Then we learn from Paul's writing to the churches of Galatia, I marvel, I'm amazed. I marvel that you're so quickly removing, American Standard Version again, removing from him that called you in the grace of Christ unto a different gospel. He says, which is not another gospel, only there are some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, should preach unto you any gospel other than that which we preached unto you. Now, how does God think about folks who mess with his word and set it aside? Let him be anathema, let him be a curse, which means let him be cut off. And there's a play on words there by the Holy Spirit through Paul. Because the Judaizing teacher is saying everybody's got to be circumcised to be saved. Paul says, here's what ought to be cut off. You. Now that's, that's pretty blunt language. And I tell you, they got the knife's edge a lot more to the point than we do sometimes. Now watch. I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. Sounds serious to me. If any man shall add unto them, it's more serious. God shall add unto him the plagues which are written in this book. I don't want that. Do you? And if any man shall take away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the tree of life and out of the holy city which are written in this book. Sounds like to me you better take real close attention and give it to 2 Timothy 2.15, Revelation 22, 18 and 19. If these verses do not tell us that God expects us to walk and live according to and in harmony with the divine pattern, what would he write to say it? The Lord said, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Matthew 28 and verse 20. Again, I say, he didn't say, now let me make this suggestion to you, boys, just before I go back to heaven. I am going to sit on my throne, I'm an absolute monarch, but everything I'm telling you is just, you can take it or leave it, it's up to you. Uh, people say, well, I wouldn't say that. They say it all the time, they just say it in more sophisticated terms. The New Testament is not a pattern. If the New Testament is not a pattern, you don't have to do what it says. Because patterns say, follow me exactly. And the examples I gave you that are designed to lead and guide and direct us in proper appreciation and submission to the will of Christ and the words of the New Testament make it very clear. Thus did Noah, thus did Moses, according to all that God commanded them, they did it. Now what does it tell you about your life and your study of the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25? Why the Bible in both the Old and the New Testament talks so much about know the Word, understand it, live it, teach it, contend for it. In fact, how would you know what God said about anything if you don't go to where He said it? And then read it. And then uh, Words have meanings. In fact, those that would disagree with what I'm now presenting understand my words very well. <laughs> no, you couldn't disagree if you didn't understand them or agree because you understand them. Paul said, now I beseech you, brethren. I'm on bended knee. Begging you is the idea of beseech. Mark them that are causing the divisions and occasions of stumbling. Now watch. How do you measure? How do you know? Contrary to the doctrine which you learn, and turn from them. What kind of people are these? Well, the Holy Spirit said, and that still ought to make some difference. For they that, serve, uh, that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, then they serve somebody. You know, everybody serves somebody. Well, God said these folks who depart from the doctrine aren't serving Christ. Well, they're going to serve somebody. He said they serve their own belly. When you, this sounds rather plain, but it fits the New Testament teaching and the words used by the Holy Spirit to speak to us so we can understand there are a lot of belly Christians around. A lot of belly Christians. And by their smooth and fair speech, they beguile, let's deceive, you know, the hearts, the inward man of those who are, who are innocent. 
Romans 16, 17, and 18. Now remember, he wrote that to the church in Rome, and so writing it, wrote part of the New Testament, and so it speaks to every member of the church. And it says, this is what can happen if you're not careful. Further, in Ephesians 5, 11, Paul said to the church in Ephesus, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Then John writes, If anyone cometh unto you and brings not this doctrine or teaching, receive him not into your house and give him no greeting. For he that gives him greeting partakes of his evil work. Second John 10. I have seen situations. I've known of others. Where somebody's lived an ungodly life in some way, they're contrary to the New Testament in belief and in their life, some way or the other. They won't repent of it. Brethren, they work with them, beg them, try to teach them, and they persist in sin. They're not going to repent. Finally, then, the faithful brethren, in order to keep the church pure and to do the last thing they know to do that the Bible says to get people to repent, they remove the fellowship that's peculiar to Christians from them and the withdrawal of the same in obedience to God's will. And there are always some brethren who, when they see those folks the next time, run up and hug them and declare to them how sorry they are that the brethren have acted so terrible towards them. Now, my Bible, and yours does too if it's a real translation of the Scriptures, says that when I do that in any way, give that kind of person greeting and aid and comfort to the enemy, is what it amounts to, in the sense that they are sinners, not in the sense they're our enemies, but aid and comfort to them in their sins, rather than do what the Bible said and the way it said it, for the reason it said it, to make them ashamed of their life, the Bible says, for he that giveth him greeting, or wishes him God's speed, partakes in his evil works. Now, how's God going to see you if you die right then and you come before the judgment? He's going to say, you partook of that evil. He did. You encouraged him in it. You know, you don't have to practice yourself the evil to encourage somebody else who's in evil. Just don't re rebuke him for his evil. And the Bible says Christians have an obligation as a part of their individual faithful life. When you see somebody in sin, you have a duty because that person's going to hell by sin. Sin's the only thing that keeps you out of heaven. There's nothing else can. And those who are members of the church, redeemed for their sins, we sang a beautiful song a while ago, redeemed, how I love to portray it, uh, how I love to sing it, to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus suffered on that cross, shed his blood, and that blood redeems us, buys us back. We are, by our own decision and choice, bond slaves to Christ because we have nobody else we can shackle ourselves to and submit to his will who will take us to glory. Nobody else is there. And we will then to become bond slaves to Christ that we might be saved by him. So when we are that way and yet a brother or sister overtaking a trespass commits sin, whether it's teaching false doctrine or ungodly life, and they won't repent and you've done all you know to do to get them to repent, you've dealt with each case on its own merits and you've been long-suffering, and they persist in their sins. Don't tell me you love them when you try to say, well, I'm so sorry they withdrew fellowship from you. You're just like them, and that's what the Bible says God sees when he sees you, and he'll treat you accordingly. Well, that sounds awful tough, preacher. That's the Word of God. Isn't that what you want? Or had you rather me tell you, just go right ahead and play in the world. God's so loving and merciful and kind and gentle, He'll let you dabble around in sin. And even if you don't, you can try to make a fellow feel like you're his best friend by condoning him in his actions. Now, down deep, we know better than that. We don't even allow it in a whole host of things in life for some reason. We don't consider that when it comes to the pattern nature of the New Testament, which is an authoritative approach to the Bible that the world just really doesn't understand. And others in the church, certainly, in order to take the church into aggression and to stop it from being what the Lord intended the church to be, they will follow after that view and try to make you think that the New Testament's nothing but a love letter in which God says you sin and you're lost. You can't save yourself. Jesus died through you. And just acknowledge that by a nod of the head toward heaven. Everything's all right. Everything else in the Bible then, just suggestion. You don't really have to be obedient to it. Just love one another. 
And what in the world of those people does that mean? Condone whatever it is they do. Because, see, there's no law, really. Because there's no pattern nature. But a pattern nature means there's a rule to follow. Our whole responsibility is to make sure we're binding only what God and His Word binds on people is obligatory. And to then be very happy when we learn where He's loosed in the liberty that's there. And not to end up binding where God hasn't bound or loosing where God hasn't loosed. In three great speeches, as we conclude, which constitute the great book of Deuteronomy, Moses emphasized to Old Testament Israel that it was because God loved them that he had given them a law. Now you think about that for a minute. Because God loved them that he had given them the law. Was it because he hated them and that their love for God would always lead them to be obedient to that law? And likewise, it's because of God's love for us that he has given us the New Testament. And it's our true love for him that will move us, motivate us, cause us, prompt us to be obedient to the authority of Christ and the words of that New Testament. If we would just understand that, that loving parents who really love their children set up pretty good codes of conduct. Because they love them, not because they hate them. They even still, some of them, love them enough to discipline them correctively to get them to abide by what they ought to in the home. Now, your children may, like some of us who are children of God and somewhat rebellious, if not a great deal of rebellious, we may say, I hate you. You don't love me. You ever heard kids do something like that? Well, remember, we're children of God. And sometimes in our rebelliousness, we can respond to his emphatic, plain, divine, infallible pattern because of what it does in governing us in the same way. And yet God says, I know the way to get you from earth to heaven. I know the path. You don't, for there is a way, though, that seemeth right unto a man, but the end there are the ways of death. So you've got to trust me implicitly on the basis of my word, so that faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. And in that word, we're taught to believe with all of our heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. We're then taught that we must repent of our sins and then confess our faith in Christ that he is the Son of God. Now we're qualified by the truth of the gospel to complete our obedience in becoming a Christian by being immersed in water by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of our sins. More than that, you don't have to do to be a Christian. Less than that, you cannot do and become one. We do just what's authorized in the great plan of salvation from the divine, infallible pattern of the New Testament. Having become a Christian, if you sin, God's second law of pardon makes it clear. Recognize you've transgressed as a child of God. Humble yourself, repent of that sin, and confess your sins before men and pray to God for forgiveness as the brethren pray with you. Now, that's how it is, but each one of those things properly understood demands a great deal from the inside of man as to his submission and the disposition of heart that allows him to truly be obedient from the heart to that form of doctrine. Folks, listen. I don't say it proudly, but that's not nearly it. That's it. That's the truth which every one of us, members of the church, are expected to teach without apology. It's the will of heaven. It declares the love of God. It tells you the way back to God. Now, what can possibly stand in your way? An old rebellious will. It just won't accept it. If you're subject to the blessed invitation of Jesus Christ to come to him, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.